Okay, here's here's how I think we should roadmap. I think we should like record like a, just a short like pre-show that we can drop in just to explain that like this is a short app and blah blah blah. Why? Um, because we don't have any material that I'm 100 percent confident we can use as pre-show, and so it'd be nice to have that just as like B-roll or something. Yeah, we could also just chit chat, and then you could selectively edit. Yeah. All right. Well, maybe we'll do all of that. Okay. This could be the pre-show. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny, actually. Why don't we start with uh, the fact that Richard is a super fan of Richard Nixon? Do you guys want to talk about no, that? No, 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 no. No, I, I don't think we should talk about that. And here's why: I think if we're going to talk about Nixon, like I'm, I'm happy to admit on the record that I that I'm a Nixon fan. I think Nixon did a lot of good things, uh, very good things, in fact. But I think that if we're going to talk about Nixon, like let's let's have it be a prepared discussion. That way, we can actually teach our listeners something, um, you know, and give them some things to chew on, as opposed to a totally off the cuff. Um, you know, Nixon discussion would be my suggestion. All right. I have, I have a suggestion for what to cover. I think, think, dude, I think first of all, there's 0% chance that we should have any discussion of Nixon in the final edit of this episode. Um, I, wow. I think we should do tort reform or not tax reform. And then we should talk about Twitter and then we should do a couple Supreme court cases. What are we, what are we going to talk about Twitter about? What? Um, I think it's worth talking about like Twitter's response to Trump tweeting those Muslim videos. What what was their response? Well, they they said that it didn't violate their terms of service. And then they came up with different reasons throughout the day why it didn't violate their terms of service. And then they said that Trump retweeting the Muslim videos was good. They said it was good that people got to see the Muslim videos that Trump retweeted. That seems kind of silly, right? Like, why why doesn't Twitter just say, look, he's the president of the United States. We're not going to ban the president of the United States. End, end of discussion. This is our website. You know, we can do whatever we want on this website. We're, we're not a we're, nonprofit we're, yet. We're not a nonprofit yet. We are not going to ban the president of the United States, no matter how uh, horrible he is or what horrible things he does or says on our website. Yeah, the president of the United States gets a voice. It's fine. You know, that that that's something they could say. So let's let's give some background. So so Donald Trump uh retweeted three videos that were like like truly vile anti-Muslim propaganda um by a far-right British group. Uh a group that like uh has some like unsubtle associations with Nazis, um, like actual like like far right neo Nazis, right? And so Donald Trump retweeted these three videos, and uh, and, and so people were like, "Oh, come on!" Like eventually, Donald Trump has to get kicked off Twitter. And and on Thursday, a Twitter spokesman said, "There may be the rare occasion when we allow controversial content or behavior which may otherwise violate our rules to remain on our service because we believe there is legitimate public interest in its availability." So on Thursday, a Twitter spokesman said, "Oh no, no, no! There's legitimate public interest in people being able to see the vile Muslim tweets." And then, uh, and then, uh. A couple days later, on fr- uh, on Friday, one day later, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey tweeted, We mistakenly pointed to the wrong reason we didn't take action on the videos. He said, We are still looking critically at all of our current policies and appreciate all the feedback. So they basically made up some dumb reason, and then they were like, Actually, JK, that's not the reason. All right, like I think Tom's right. Basically, the real reason for what's happening is that uh, they're not going to kick the President of the United States off of Twitter. But between you and me, the correct public policy is for them to kick the president of the United States off of Twitter. No, I don't think so, dude. I, I, so I, I think they should let Donald Trump be on Twitter. I think they should let him tweet the sort of vile and terrible things that he tweets. Uh, and, you know, I think it's terrible. But, you know, the you know, the American people elected this person, sort of, at least. Uh, and <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, th- this is sort of. This is like one of the downsides of democracy, right? Is that every now and then you get something like this. But the beauty of democracy is that we get to sort of right the mistakes that were made, you know, through the democratic process, or at least, you know, we hope if the democratic process works. And we can have another debate on on that some other time. Um, 
but you know, I don't. I don't think we should outsource to Twitter. Uh, you know, the job of of being the policeman of what is decent or not. Like he's the president of the United States. He's completely indecent. He's a terrible human being. Uh, and you know, as, as much as I wish he wouldn't tweet, and you know, I, I think he probably does deserve to get kicked off Twitter. Like, let him be on Twitter and and let this happen, and and let's hopefully watch uh, watch the people in a democratic system sort of rise to the occasion and say we're we're not okay with this, as opposed to having Twitter do the do the hard work that otherwise we should be doing through the democratic process. So if Twitter were like some some essential component of the fabric of our democracy, right? Like if, if Twitter were like the public square or something, there'd be one thing. This is like a company, right? This is a company that doesn't have to provide a platform to like to, to the most hateful groups in America, right? Like this is a company that uh, has finally succumbed to pressure to start de- uh, unverifying um, right-wing extremists, et cetera, et cetera. And so the idea that like, oh, you know, let let like the battle of ideas be contested in the marketplace like that's fine but if i if i'm a twitter shareholder i don't think the contest of ideas has to happen like on my forum i i don't think that's twitter's reasoning at all like the real the reason twitter doesn't kick trump off is that people go to twitter to see what trump is saying they want those eyes on their web page the, their reasoning isn't oh you know this is a free marketplace of ideas um, you can bet your bottom dollar that, or the your last dollar that, if these Nazis that are getting de-verified and banned were attracting more eyes on their website, Twitter would be uh, throwing up some, you know, argument about the marketplace of ideas. When in reality, their reasoning is in, entirely um, self-interested. I just think I just think it must be so demoralizing to be affiliated with Twitter, to be a shareholder or to be working at Twitter and to understand that like like American. I mean, first of all, if you're a Twitter shareholder, you're like demoralized because Twitter's not having any user growth or revenue growth. But other than that, like it's like like the, the, the Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, like both like like vehemently condemn these tweets. Right. Like like uh, I, I should. I think we people, all should. I think people here don't quite appreciate like how upsetting these tweets were to people in Britain. You know, I just think that they're the, you know, if, if I were someone who were affiliated with Twitter, I would say that, you know, I, I would personally be embarrassed that these are things that are happening on a platform that I contribute to. Well, I mean, you know, I, I guess I would say that like th- this, in some ways, this is the purpose of Twitter, right? It's, there are some abominable views out there. Trump has many of those views, uh, and let them be, let those views be sort of shamed and rejected in the public square, you know? And, uh, and I think that's kind of what's happening, right? I mean, it, it's, it's not, it's, okay, it's taking longer than I would what, like. If but, these ideas you know? should be shamed and rejected in the public square, then you should host house, party, house parties and invite Nazis to your house parties so that people can understand Why? the Nazis' ideas. Because p- these ideas should be debated in the public square. You should organize parties at your house for people to debate Nazis. No, I... No, I I think just just let if the idea it's it's an easily rejected idea, like let it be rejected. Yeah, you know I, what I mean. mean? And, and Ruchit's house is the public square in all fairness. But I, I yeah. think the the better response to to Ruchit is that um, these ideas aren't being shamed and 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 um, uh, rejected so then in they the should public be. square. Hold, then they should me, be. Let me finish. Um, what's what's actually happening is that Twitter is siloing people into their different, um, you know. Uh, like follower groups so that, you know, the people that hate these ideas are all talking to each other about how horrible these ideas are. And the Nazis are just uh, uh, thinking, oh, you know, we've got our own little section of Twitter and we can hang out and do whatever we want. I mean, that is is a sufficient reason to ban these these individuals off Twitter. Well, so I think, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess all I'm talking about is sort of like, you know, the man's the president of the United States. Let him speak, and let's 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 sort of tear apart his ideas. But you I don't mean, like you have no obligation to give Donald Trump a platform, right? Like you have no like like Twitter is is a publicly traded company, but it's still privately owned, right? Like the government doesn't own Twitter. Um, I mean, I kind of think Twitter should be nationalized, and then it would be different. But as long as as long as Twitter, it would it would be much worse, probably. But yeah, well, it's hard to get worse than it is now. Oh, it could get much worse, I'm sure. Anyway, um, I guess sort of I, I, I think that a lot of folks sort of reflexively 
react to situations like these with let these ideas be debated in the public sphere and that's great but if i'm like someone who's responsible for furnishing this platform to donald trump and i have no like legal obligation to do so i just do it because i'm unthinking or uncritical or even worse because i think he should have this platform i think that's like bad i think people have like a personal moral responsibility to right like this is this is not a public park right this is not a public school this is just a private company right it's publicly traded but it is a private company and it is the culmination of the decisions of private individuals and people don't have any obligation to furnish a platform to donald trump right like cnn doesn't uh twitter doesn't there's there's no obligation i i think if we don't like discuss the ideas that the president of the united states has like I don't know. I think avoid avoiding discussion of these things or saying that, you but that's, know, you, Rich, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying no, you that, are right? like I just said I just said precisely that's not what I'm saying. Right. You're saying, oh, like this needs to this needs to happen in the marketplace of ideas. And I'm not saying that that's wrong. Right. I'm just saying that no one in particular has an obligation to furnish a platform to the president. To me, this is a little bit like saying no one in particular has an obligation to represent like a mass murderer. That that's true. That that's true. I mean, that's yeah. No one does, except for like the public defender, right? Like, like you you have a right to counsel, but people don't have a right to Twitter. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know that people have a right to Twitter. I agree with you on that, but well, I mean, listen, Twitter can do whatever it wants. Like, I I don't care what Twitter does. Yeah, right? that's what I think the problem is. That I should care. No, anyway, I, I don't know. I think we're just repeating ourselves now. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how valuable this entire discussion is. Oh, it's very valuable. All right. Um, AJ's going to cut it entirely from the show. No, he's not, dude. He's going to include all of it. If if you or I were having this discussion, I, th- I think AJ would, would, uh, would no doubt be like, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> nah, this is good. All right. Um, <laughs> what? Tax, the tax bill? What about the tax bill? Here's what I think the big takeaway is. It's like sad. It's like I think it's just sad. Like I think we should feel sad, and it is sad. Do we need to give any background? Um, the Senate this week on on a Friday at like t- at two a.m. Friday night at two a.m. They voted that they're going to uh, they they voted on their version of the House bill for um for cutting taxes, and they're gonna it increases the deficit over a ten year window by about one point four trillion, and it actually raises um, it raises taxes on millions and millions and millions of Americans. Although it does give huge tax cuts to corporations and the wealthy, it also has um, it also repeals the individual mandate in the uh, Affordable Care Act, which the CBO has said will will um, cause there at the end of ten years to be thirteen million fewer Americans with insurance, and will cause premiums to rise in most years ten percent, not just ten percent over ten years, but in most years it will rise in ten percent for that year. Right, so. Over, you know, say over like uh, a 10 year window, you could be looking at premiums, say, p- perhaps even doubling. Anyway, um, it seems bad. It seems bad and it seems ill considered. And uh, portions of the bill were handwritten because they rushed it through so quickly. There wasn't time to actually like type it. So overall, I think everyone involved should be ashamed and feel bad. Yeah. I mean, I think we covered, we covered most of this stuff on the last episode. You know, I think the, uh, they just use the Republicans use sort of a terrible process for this, right? They they sort of did this entire tax bill in about three weeks. I think they had you know maybe one public hearing, uh, and they want to pass something, right? So this is sort of like a it's just a very I mean not only is it a bad outcome, it's a very bad process for uh, for making public policy, and. I think a lot of the people, John McCain included, who w- were uh, sort of standing or had stood or at least claimed to stand for wanting to make public policy the correct way, uh, definitely did not do it in this situation. You know, I think it's a it's an it's just not something that's necessary. We don't need a tax cut right now. Um, and if, if we if we were to have a tax cut, I, we definitely wouldn't structure it in a way that actually raises taxes on millions of, of middle class households. Yeah. I mean, if we were going to cut taxes, we should actually cut taxes. I mean, that that I think is like one of the core concepts. Uh, hey, yeah. Breach. Yeah. Did you hear that the or did you see that the Washington Post uh, created a tax calculator to show you how this tax bill? Shut will up. Affect Seriously. You? Are you kidding? Yeah. No, I'm not kidding. Oh, wait, I want to wait. Can you link it? I'll link it into the Slack and on the show notes. Oh, my God. This is amazing. You know, I 
the Washington Post has sort of proven itself to be the most worthwhile news outlet uh, in the Trump era. It really has. Like they, they deserve a lot of credit. It's a pretty simple tax calculator, though. It doesn't really break down, you know, how the exemptions will be oh. will affect you. Wait, no, this is exactly the thing Richard was complaining about. All it does is is ask your household income. Oh, Everything wow. I said about the Washington Post, I now retract. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, I, I feel like this is sort of the flow for Rooch. You know, he says some nice things about some entity or person and then immediately retracts it. No, dude. This is like the fact that this is, this is basically useless. <laughs> um, so there, there was like one interesting thing that happened Friday night that maybe is worth talking about just briefly. Uh, so after M- Mitch McConnell announced that they had 51 votes, you know, he said, we've, we've got 51 votes. They're, we're definitely doing a bill, right? But they still hadn't released the bill text at that point. Um, so the, they released the bill text and it, you know, stuff's like handwritten in the margins, et cetera, et cetera. And they start the Votorama. So the Votorama for, for reconciliation bills, there's a period where you have to let everybody, um, make amendments it goes you know it's like an open floor process and so marco rubio had this amendment that he proposed that would increase the child tax credit and it was like a real it was a real difficult decision for democrats right so that if all 48 democrats or even if if big chunks of the of the 48 democrats in the senate had voted for marco rubio's amendment then they they would have um you know then they would have amended the bill to include this child tax credit you know, Marco Rubio, Mike Lee would have voted for it, and a couple other Republicans. It ended up, it ended up getting about uh, thirty-four votes or something total. Some D's voted for it, some D's didn't. But if if the Democrats had actually voted for it, um, then it would have been in the bill. They w- could have made the bill better. And so, I, I guess the question I have for y'all is: Do you think that Democrats should have voted for the amendment? Well, I, I, well, I think some in- important background to that issue is that the at, at the last minute before. Um, you know, the decision time to vote, uh, Rubio sort of um, backed away from the the uh, extent of the credit that he wanted to give to try to lure some Republicans on board. And I think that pushed Democrats off voting um, to where at the end it only had the support of nine Democrats. Right. I don't know. I guess I can't judge the Democrats on whether they should have I don't know what I would have done in that situation. I think this is like a very bad bill, but on the one hand, it's certainly going to pass or it looks like it's going to pass. And so if you can make the bill marginally better, do you, you know, I don't know. I think I definitely wouldn't criticize anybody no matter how they came down on that issue. Yeah. I just, I just think it's interesting. Right. I mean, I sort of, I sort of half suspect, you know, when I, when I was following it at the time, I sort of suspected that it was the same situation as, as the the Republican political strategy for the last several years, which has been that, that no legislative achievement of the opposing party should have even the slightest hint of bipartisanship, right? And so for, for the Democrats to have succeeded in offering and voting for some amendment to the bill, you know, that would have been difficult for their electoral strategy. Um, and I thought that was sort of cynical. But then later, um, you know, the Democrats did all vote for an amendment to the bill and sort of lend that bipartisan imprimatur to the bill. So now I actually have no idea what the Democrats were thinking. I, I think this is like totally a fascinating thing. What did situation. they end up voting for? What um, did they end up voting for? There, this is ridiculous. So the, so the, the, the amendment that they actually did end up voting for was there was a tax credit offered on the floor um, by Pat Toomey. And the the tax credit was basically an ex- so one of the things that the bill does now is it taxes the um, endowments of universities and they said oh okay there, here's this one extremely specific exemption to the university endowment tax and it wasn't like it didn't say this specifically it didn't say like oh Hillsdale College is the one university that's exempt. But it was written in a way where the only university anyone could identify that was exempt would be Hillsdale College. So what's Hillsdale College? It's an, it's an extremely, extremely right-wing private college. Eric Prince went there. The um, the brother of Betsy DeVos went there. Oh, isn't that Betsy DeVos's? Uh... Yeah, yeah. Betsy DeVos's brother went there. And so the um, the it, it got <laughs> offered on the floor and voted in this, this tax exemption for Hillsdale College in particular. And then... Later in the night, very shortly before passage, uh, I think it was Lankford, 
um, offered an amendment to remove, to basically remove that amendment that had already been adopted. And all, almost all the Democrats voted for it, or I think all the Democrats voted for it. So did it actually get taken off? Yeah, it got taken out. Oh, nice. Wasn't that the, wasn't that the scribbled amendment? No, that was something else. Oh, okay. That, I mean, that seems like a good thing, right? Like, yeah, you don't no, want great. to uh, um, benefit an individual with such a, a giant tax bill. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't see what you're what, what the problem is, AJ. No, no, no. I don't think that's a problem. I just think it's I think it's interesting that that you know if if Democrats had been voting ag- uh, against the child tax credit amendment for you know t- in order to avoid lending any era bipartisanship to the bill, well, later they actually voted for an amendment anyway. Right, so they like they didn't succeed in withholding any sort of bipartisanship label. I I think at the end of the day, though, it's going to be the final vote that you know makes the news. It's going to be you know, did any Democrat vote with the Republicans to pass the bill as an entirety, not you know some procedural vote on? Yeah, not just some amendment. Well, yeah, in that case, they like probably should have voted for the child tax credit. I think a child tax credit is like a big deal, you know. Um, whereas like. I mean, that could actually be argued as a bipartisanship effort, but like, you know, removing some obscure amendment that, you know, helped one specific college, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem the same, I guess. Anyway, I think the whole thing's pretty interesting. The, uh, should we do Supreme Court cases, dude? Yeah, let's do Supreme Court cases. Um, I only have one Supreme Court case this time around. I should have more, uh, next week. Sounds good, dude. Hit it. You want to hear it? Yeah, okay. dude. Starting from the top. Um, so this case is called uh, named Class v. United States, and the issue in this case is, does a guilty plea inherently waive a defendant's right to challenge the constitutionality of his conviction? So I, I think, you know, this is um, sort of um, uh, uh, timely in the sense that we have uh, Flynn pleading guilty to... Um, you know, lying to the FBI, turning state's evidence, all that kind of jazz, right? So at the at the center of this case is, look, a plea of guilty is an agreement between the criminal defendant, like, uh, you know, General Flynn, and the United States of America, right? And, you know, inside that agreement, there are going to be various terms. You know, in Flynn's agreement, for example, there are terms like you're going to cooperate and you're going to be honest, and we're not going to sentence you until all of this cooperation is done, and so that we can take your cooperation and efforts into account when we sentence you, right? Um, the question here is, well, what if inside the guilty plea, the, the agreement that you reach with the United States, you don't actually um, say, you know what, um, I'm going to um, plead guilty, but I'm going to reserve my right to challenge the constitutionality of the the entire law that you're bringing, right? Um, d- does... Does that fact waive your right to um, to uh, later challenge the you know constitutionality of your conviction, right? And so this this particular case arises in the context of the Second Amendment. Um, it's this individual named Rodney Class, and he describes himself um, as a Second Amendment warrior. Um, he uh, allegedly told the FBI after his arrest, that he is a constitutional bounty hunter who Love travels ar- around the country with guns and other weapons in order to enforce federal laws against... Is this person competent to stand trial? Don't love <laughs> How this. is this person Don't competent do- to like make a plea? Yeah. Well, so in, in what happened with him was he... So he's traveling around the country, right? And he's got all these guns in his... Um, in his um, uh, car in the trunk of his car he's got as one does i'm not seeing any problems so far he's Keep got going. ammunition he's he's got a- ammunition that's in there, okay. right gotta and have he's ammunition got, he's got several knives as well right okay okay not seeing any problems yet tom he drives into dc the district of columbia oh sh- right that's when things go bad and he he parks in a permit only lot a thousand feet from the united states permit Capitol. only yeah permit only lot a thousand s- does he have any morals <laughs> it says permit why is only, he succumb- right why is he succumbing to the authority of the government wait yeah. hold on it says permanent like 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 people have private property rights like you own private property you put up a sign that says permit only like permit only dude this is a i i think this might be a u.s capital lot right like so um 
you know, do, it, it, wouldn't that be all of our property? Yeah, he he torted me. <laughs> this was everything that it, we fought for as a country, and he just said yeah. no, f you guys. All right. So, so what happened was he so he leaves his guns, his ammunition, and the several knives in his car, and decides to walk to the nearby Senate and office House offices to, um, I guess, take a tour without his guns. Yeah, no, he he leaves the guns in the car. He leaves the ammunition in the car. He leaves the knives in the car. How's he going to defend himself? He, I guess he, he can't. He, he's defenseless. Um, so, he, yeah, he, he, he goes and, and, and does his thing. But then, you know, obviously it's a permit-only lot. Some, you know, um, meter maids get upset. And, you know, the whole thing blows Federal up. And they discover, Yeah. Uh, they discover the guns, the knives, the ammunition. And he's charged with a law, uh, a federal law, that makes it illegal for him to have ready access to um, such firearms on the Capitol grounds. Okay? So... Class, you know, obviously files a motion challenging the law under the Second Amendment, um, but he lost, right? He, he, he tells the district judge, hey, judge, you know, this law that, that they're charging me with is unconstitutional. Uh, and the judge says, no, it's not. Go away. Right? And so he decides, okay, well, that, there, there goes, there goes uh, any, any opportunity I had to win that argument. So he decides to plead guilty, so enters into a plea agreement with the government, um and, and and plead guilty. Now, after did he have counsel? Yeah. I, well, yeah. I assume he did. I'm I'm, I'm not sure off the top. He's of my a constitutional head. warrior. You don't need yeah. to like go around <laughs> hiring lawyers for that. You know what I mean? Like you bring your copy of the Constitution. That's all you need. Yeah, I, I don't think the counsel the the counsel thing is necessarily dispositive to the to this case. I I don't think it affects the case one way or the other. Um. Anyway, after his uh plea and arraign uh, his um you know, sentencing and all that, he wants to appeal um, the denial of the Second Amendment challenge, right? He wants to go to the the uh, appellate court and eventually the Supreme Court and say these D.C. laws that prevent me to have guns in my, my trunk are, are unconstitutional. And and the government says, look, buddy, you entered into this plea, plea agreement and, you know, your plea agreement doesn't say anything about reserving the right to appeal based on the Constitution. We might have changed our minds. We might have decided, you know what, we're giving you too much of a sweetheart deal um, in this plea agreement if you're going to reserve the right to um, uh, uh, reserve the right to appeal um, our, our, the, the decision, right? Uh, now, based on this, you might think that class doesn't have very much of a uh, of a chance, but class is relying on two primary cases. One is Blackledge v. Perry, which holds that a vindictive prosecution claim can survive a plea agreement. So you can appeal um, your even if you enter into a plea agreement that doesn't reserve any rights based on vindictive prosecution. And then Menia v. United New York is a 1975 case, which holds that double jeopardy claims survive a plea agreement. So you can appeal a plea agreement, you, you, even if you enter into a plea agreement which does not reserve the right to appeal based on double jeopardy, you can still appeal that double jeopardy claim. So uh, the entire issue is, well, is, is a constitutional arrangement uh, or, or, or appeal uh, similar enough to the, the reasoning in these cases such that we're going to say, even if you don't expressly reserve the right to appeal um, under the Constitution— you um you can still do so um uh as as a matter of constitutional law what do you guys think dude i um this is so good i really love this case because this case combines so for our listeners you know a lot of times the supreme court it, it, on criminal law issues they tend to sort of split a little bit more liberal conservative and so typically the liberal justices are you know and correct me where i'm wrong guys or maybe where i'm being too bold um tend to be more forgiving to criminal defendants right and uh the conservative justices tend to be less forgiving to criminal defendants right um l- let's just say that the the Due process rights and things of that nature, sort of broadly speaking, matter more, generally speaking, to the liberal justices to the conserv- than to the conservative justices. Or at least the liberal justices are more sensitive uh, to it. Now, so, so this case has that element. But the other element that it has, which is fascinating, and the two elements are, of course, mixed, is uh, there's a gun element to it. And 
as as most people or as many people probably know on gun issues the liberal justices tend to be more in favor of uh of laws that are uh that are restrictive of uh of second amendment rights and then or they at least tend to be more permissive of those laws and the conservative justices tend to be much less permissive of uh of said laws so the mixing of these two things here with guns and criminal defendants makes for a really interesting uh, kind of lineup. Yeah. Did I? Yeah. It's um, uh, I wanted to highlight that for people just in case it wasn't uh, already uh, obvious. So here's where I, I, I think that when you cop to a plea, I do think you should continue to have the right to challenge the constitutionality of, uh, of the plea that you copped or of the law that you copped to. Mm-hmm. Because uh, really, otherwise, what you do is you put the you put the defendant in sort of kind of like a what is it? Is it the Hobson's choice? Yeah. Did, sorry, I, I might I might have missed it in the in the background. Did the plea agreement say specifically whether he was waiving his right to an appeal? That's the entire issue. Is is if the plea agreement is silent, can you know can he still? maintain that appeal right like if if the plea agreement says you know what no i think it's like i think it's like nino he can maintain the appeal you think so yeah yeah um well you know the 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 flip side of the argument is like this is a a, you know what uh, some of the the folks made this argument um it's a silly rule to have because if you hold that you know the plea agreement survives um absent um you know an express reservation then um, every plea agreement will have an express reservation for constitutional issues. I mean, yeah, it does. It, it seems like something where, and as you, I think, you know, every future plea agreement, plea agreement will just say you waive your right to a constitutional challenge, right? I mean, mm-hmm. but maybe that'll be the next case. But yeah, every, I, I'm with AJ. Every plea I'm agreement already said, right? Like, like, hold on, like, because, because, like, so, like, contracts have like an entirety clause, right? Right, like the the like one of those clauses that says like, oh, the, you know, this contract is the entire agreement of the parties. Right. Mm-hmm. The idea is that there's there's not some other piece of paper that is also somehow like incorporated into the contract or or the contract should be read in reference to that other piece of paper. Like almost every contract I've ever seen has some sort of like entirety clause. Right. And so to me, it's like it's like crazy that you're like, oh, we're worried the plea agreements are going to have to include this boilerplate because every other legal document includes a bunch of boilerplate. No, no. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. But like. That that's the thing, right? Like, I think there's a significant portion of, um, you know, significant legal thought out there that that boilerplate shouldn't be included. Like, if you can craft a rule to avoid having excess verbiage or vo- boilerplate in in agreements, you you that's a good thing. I mean, that, that that's a con- that's a pretty conservative argument too, right? Like that that's that's um a, a, you know an argument that I think a lot of conservatives buy into, like the idea that that um you know the plain text of whatever document you have should govern um, the issues before you, particularly in a, in a, in a contractual agreement where both parties are agreeing to, to things. And if you don't, um, if the plain text doesn't contain a, um, uh, a, a specific uh, uh, reservation, then you're assuming that the parties didn't agree to any reservation. I wonder if the court will go broader. And we'll just say that, uh, you know, you don't waive your right to challenge the ever. Yeah, like even if you put in an express uh, clause in in the in the agreement that defendant waives the um, the right to challenge the constitutionality on appeal, even if 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 they put that clause into the contract, you don't waive it. What if there's a clause in there where defendant agrees that they have been given competent counsel? There usually is. Yeah, there usually yeah. Okay, so does that mean that you can't challenge uh, on ineffective counsel grounds? I don't know the answer. Um, to I, that. Yeah, I, I think that's the case because the only two situations that the case law has held out that that I'm aware of is the the vindictive prosecution and the double jeopardy. Hmm. All right, so Rooch, what's your vote split? There, there might be there, there might now. Let me let me just say there might be a um, ability to collaterally attack um, plea agreements, but I'm I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate that, like, in order to have, you know, sort of a finality here um, in a plea agreement and to sort of incentivize plea agreements, you can't be sort of constantly attacking them after the fact. So maybe it would be too broad to just say generically, uh, you can mm-hmm. always attack the constitutionality of your, um, you know, 
of the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe that's that's too broad. I I, I think it's nine o. I think it's nine o. Yeah, they may not. Yeah, yeah, nine o for um, what's his name? Class. Yeah, nine o for class. class. Yeah. AJ, I already said nine o for class. Me three. Yeah, I oh. I think we're all in, in agreement here. Um. Yeah. What did, what did the lower court say, Tom? What's that? What did the lower court say in this situation? Yeah. Um, so the District of Columbia basically said, look, there are two exceptions to this um, rule that, um, you know, you can challenge your, your on appeal, um, your, uh, your lower court um, holding if you have a plea agreement and neither of those exceptions meet are uh, applicable to classes case. So they, they found for the government. Okay. So Supreme, that's Supreme Court for today. No more cases? Uh, I'll have some more next week. Um, oh. I thought you were going to say Trump had abolished the court. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll go with my side by first. Um, I'm going to link you guys in the um, Slack and anywhere else and in the show notes this uh, BuzzFeed article Whoa. that... This is where the stingrays yes. are. Yes. So like what Bu- BuzzFeed did was they tracked down all of these FBI planes um, that are doing surveillance on American citizens. This is nuts. And so you can see their flight maps uh, using this map. Um, and you can see they're just like flying circles um, around various areas. So what 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 is this? Click the link. Okay, I've clicked it. What is this? Tom just told you what it was. Yeah, I just told you. No, 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 you didn't. You said You said that there's like... This is a map of FBI spy planes. What FBI spy planes? I don't know anything about FBI spy planes. Oh, Rich is such a good citizen. <laughs> no, I mean, maybe our listeners don't either. I might not be the only one that doesn't know about these FBI oh, spy planes. Our listeners are such good citizens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, government surveillance planes routinely circle um, the skies over most major cities. Why? Um, so they can see what you're doing. Yeah, they have so they have these devices called stingrays that one drain your cell phone battery, but even worse, they um, intercept all of your cellular communications. Hold on a second; these assholes are, re- are the reason why my cell phone battery is not like doing as well. Like this could be the this could be the argument to get the FBI and the CIA off our backs. And all this time, you've been hating on uh, Apple. This could be the thing that convinces the vast majority of Americans that the FBI has gone too far. Like, this is a winning campaign issue. If you've ever been at, like, a protest or a rally and your cell phone gets, like, really terrible battery life, a lot of people think it's because of stingrays. Yeah. So uh, you can see the maps. The, 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 there's the uh, – on this page. But you can also see, like, what equipment these uh, spy planes have on them. You know, like cameras and, you know – Augmented reality systems, cell phone tracking. Why do they take the weekends off? Dude, they're government employees. Dude, this is some BS. I cannot believe they're doing this. Like, they're just flying these planes around, you know, to do generic, like, sort of just tracking of people. Like, of everyone. Richard's so innocent. I love it. This is some bull, man. Oh, my God. I love it. Mm -hmm. Rich is such a good citizen. Are you looking at the maps? Rich, like, loves this country. Yeah, I do love this country, and like I'm pissed that they're doing this. All right, should we do my sidebar? Sure. No, dude, I'm. This is this is like this should be an episode in and of itself. Whoa! One of these maps says Farouk's mosque on it. Yeah, they really flew and circled around this mosque. Dude, I'm donating some money to the EFF right now. <laughs> like the Electronic <laughs> Frontier Foundation is getting my money right now. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty funny. Like I've been, I've been a kind of an ACLU exclusively guy for a little while in terms of civil liberty stuff, but the EFF has just because this article talks about how the Electronic Frontier Foundation released a series of documents obtained through a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit, in which FBI officials discussed the use of cell site simulators from aircraft. They're they're basically tracking, you know, they're just generically tracking American citizens and trying to pick up like the data that you're using. So, I don't know. Maybe if I'm, like, not super lazy, I'll find it for you later. But there have been, like, a bunch of news articles about how cops, like, that use stingrays have ended up dropping cases because they don't want to have to, like, reveal the source of the evidence in court. Wow. The EFF has a surveillance self-defense, like... All right. I'm going to do my sidebar. What's your sidebar? My sidebar is Cards Against Humanity Saves America. Uh, Dot com. 
Cards Against Humanity Saves America. I'm going to drop this in the Slack. They have a YouTube video and they have a website. And so Cards Against Humanity, the popular uh, the popular tabletop card game, you may be familiar, have a campaign to save, to save America. So what, what they did is they um, they bought like a parcel of land in South Texas and they hired an eminent domain lawyer and their plan is to make it really inconvenient to build the border wall. Oh, you know, on that topic, like uh, there is a golf course uh, along the Rio Grande in Texas that um, is doing something similar. But uh, I recently heard that the, the Trump administration was planning to build the wall around the golf course on the north side so that they would be basically ceding this ground to Mexico. Um, that's pretty funny. Anyway, so th- this campaign is actually like, I mean, I understand that this is like, like sort of uh empty consumerism and it's like they're not like it, it doesn't seem like it actually is helping but like no give them credit give them credit this is good shit, dude but like so uh it was they 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 got like tens of thousands of donations of like 15 dollars each and in exchange they um are going to send you like six little gift packages throughout the holiday season and so i've already gotten my first gift package and it's like pretty cool wow aj why didn't you tell us we could buy this stuff um it like sold out fairly quickly um, Dude, they hired Graves Doherty. <laughs> yeah, so I like I I have a friend who's a who's a partner at Graves Doherty, and I like texted him. I was like, "Hey, how did this like, how did this happen?" And he was like, "Oh yeah, they just like found me." So he, your your buddy is the eminent domain lawyer. Uh, I mean, it's, he's a partner at the firm, so like, kind of. But but did he work on this? Um, yeah, I think so. He's not on the letterhead that I got, but it's still like pretty cool. Dude, you should see if we can interview him. Um, it's like very tempting. Anyway, so they, like, hired a local firm in Austin, and they have uh, an eminent domain lawyer, and they, like, send out little gift packages, and they have funny YouTubes. It's, like, this is, like, extremely interesting. Um, I'm, like, really hype about it. I think this is going to be cool. Dude. So what's happening on day two, day three, day four, all that? I don't know. They haven't done it yet. I mean, so far, all I've gotten is, like, a map and some Cards Against Humanity cards. (laughs) They built a 30-foot catapult. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, since the trump administration is committed to using 12th century military technology to protect our country from mexican invaders we have responded in kind by building a 30 foot trebuchet a medieval catapult (laughs) so i also like i highly encourage watching the like promotional youtube oh this is so good this is your best sidebar ever (laughs) um anyway good stuff rooch what's your sidebar Dude, so my sidebar is this. Uh, so, have you guys heard of the Wait But Why blog? Have you guys heard about this? It's a he's a guy that uses like kind of cartoon drawings to explain stuff. Um, anyway, so he wrote a couple of posts on artificial intelligence, and this is an area that I've been uh, trying to learn more about. And so, it's probably like I don't know a couple hours of reading in general. Uh, but he explains this stuff really, really well, and I haven't read all of it yet. But uh, anyway, if you want to learn more about like kind of artificial intelligence, and you feel like you're not quite, you don't quite know that much about it, other than like the one or two articles that you read every week or every few weeks about it, then uh, this could be for you. What 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 is something interesting that you learned? He's, I mean, so one of the things that he's talking about, which is pretty interesting, is that you know we're this again. Some of this stuff is obvious, but he sort of just points out that like. You know, where we are in terms of human progress feels like pretty normal to us. But the um, but, you know, based on sort of his evaluation of AI, like there's a a ton more to come. And it's just something that we can't really see in front of us. And so he tries to kind of explain it. I mean, I I can't I can't like give. Why, Why does he think that? Well, I mean, he thinks that because of a lot of the advances that are happening in artificial intelligence and the ability of machines to like teach themselves, for example, uh, and able to their, their ability to sort of solve problems that uh, they don't that that we can't even like properly define, for example. I'm kind of bearish on current AI. Yeah, I, I don't know very much about it. So anyway, this is if if you too want to learn more about it, this is a way for you to do it. I don't want to learn more about it. That you definitely shouldn't look into this. All right, I'm, I'm not going to click on this link that you never put in the Slack. Dude, what are you talking about? I put it in the American Heartland. There's like a graph. Human yeah, progress dude. through time. and Okay. Well, okay. Rooch. It's all there, dude. It's, it's all there. It is there. I agree with you. Do 
do you guys know like a good factory in Ho Chi Minh City that makes jackets? Do you guys know any any good factories there? Oh my god. Why why would we know that? Tom, you guys are fountains of knowledge and uh certainly our listeners expect us to be fountains of knowledge. And so I figured that maybe you already knew that. Like a good factory in Ho Chi Minh City that can make me a jacket. Why don't you just get a, a jacket from uh, a retailer in America? They're all made in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, or at least the ones that, the one that I want appears to be made in Ho Chi Minh City. And so I'm just thinking, like maybe I should just, you know, like find the manufacturer in Ho Chi Minh City. You know, I mean, go to the source, dude. Like I want to pay the laborer, you know, as much as possible. Like I don't need to be paying some middleman. You know, Rich, you could just make your own jacket. Yeah, but I'm a cat. I'm I'm a, I want to redistribute wealth, dude. Like the best way for me to redistribute wealth is to like take some money that I have and pay someone else to do something. You know, I think I might be too sick to go to Warby Parker. I'm like trying to estimate. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely gonna have to bail on Warby Parker. Are you guys need, serious? Yeah, I need to do some work. If you're sick, should you definitely like? If I'm sick, should I try on glasses? The doctor said I might be contagious, but he wasn't like certain. He said not to, like, do any smooches on my wife. Definitely don't um, try on any glasses, like, before I try on that pair. You know what I mean? (laughs) I'm really annoyed because I really want to go to the eyeglass store because I really want to order more eyeglasses. Just go, dude. Whatever. Now the cops are going to, like, have this recording. What, that you went to the eyeglass store? No, they're not. You need to destroy this recording. Oh, my God. Yeah, just edit it out. Have you so uh, a slight side bar? Um, have you guys seen this video of John Tester manhandling the uh, tax bill? Yeah, it's pretty dope. Rooch, he, he's your boy. I haven't seen it. He's your boy. I do like John Tester. I called John Tester. You guys know that, right? You what? How'd that call go? Yeah. So like the day that John Tester got elected to the U.S. Senate. Okay. So like the first time, right? Um, so however many years ago this was. Um, me and my buddy Ziad were just hanging out and, uh, you know, we went on the internet to find John Tester's cell phone number and we found it and we left him a voicemail congratulating him. What did he say? He didn't call back. Wow. But it was wow. him, dude. It was definitely him. Like we found his, cause you know, he was like a Montana state Senator or something. Right. So like finding his cell phone number was like, you know, no more difficult than like I don't know, probably more difficult than like finding some random, you know, any random person's cell phone number. So I think he was also mayor of a city in Montana, too. I really like John Tester, even though he didn't call back. Hmm. Which I, if John Tester, if you're listening to this, you know, I guess call me back. Hey, John, if you're listening to this, from me to you, congrats. Like, hey, you know, I mean, like, that was basically what we did. We said, hey, you know, hey, John, you know, like, we're really, you know, really proud of you. Like, glad that you won. And, you know, congratulations. And anyway, call us back. We wanted to talk. Wanted to catch up. You know? Yeah. So imagine, like, imagine that same message, but, like, sincere. Like, that's how I feel. No, that that's that's how we felt, too. That's how I do feel. I like John Tester. Yeah. Hey, John. Hey, John, come on the show. I want to say congrats. Yeah, there you go. He can even talk about, like, uh, you know. How he feels about the tax bill or something. He feels bad. The tax bill makes him mad. He's real mad in this video. I love his his hair. Like his sort of flat top head. Like it's great. You know? Dude, he's kind of done everything. You know? He's been like a... He's been a, a music teacher in the big Sandy school district. Um, you know? He's an organic farmer. You know? What does he farm? Organs. 